Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Oklahoma Venture Forum podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Golding. I'm joined by a very special guest today, Mike Beckham, the CEO of Simple Modern. He is our keynote speaker for the 2023 OVF Awards on Thursday, May 18th at the Oklahoma History Center. Thank you for being on the podcast today, Mike. Yeah, thanks for having me. I think it's an oversimplification to say that Simply Mo- Simple Modern produces water bottles. Yes. The massive oversimplification, right? Right. So we're going to get into the conversation about what Simple Modern does as not just products, but as a business as a whole. Uh, have a conversation about that amazing success that you've created in less than a decade here mm-hmm. in Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. You're reshoring or bringing back domestic manufacturing to the middle of the country, to the middle of the United States. The mission-driven and value-based business model, which is a huge emphasis for you and the reason that Simple Modern exists. And keeping Oklahoma's brightest at home. Mm-hmm. As, a, as, a, as an Oklahoman, as an OU graduate, we're so happy that you're here and part of this conversation. So thanks for being on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to talk about these subjects. So real quick, just tell everyone, name your title and, and, and how you came to be the CEO of Simple Modern. Sure. My name is Mike Beckham. I'm a Oklahoman my entire life and have lived in Norman with my wife since I graduated from the University of Oklahoma in 2003. Worked in the nonprofit world for about 10 years before I got involved in the business world and have been involved in businesses, uh, especially having to do with e-commerce for almost the last 14 years. Was a co-founder of Simple Modern in 2015 and served as the CEO ever since then. Like I said earlier, it's oversimplification to say this, but Simple Modern provides premium drinkware and consumer products to retail partners like Amazon, Target, and Sam's Club. Right. That's the basic idea of what you guys do, but it's so much more. Recently, you've opened a multi-million dollar manufacturing facility here in Oklahoma City. In Oklahoma City or in Moore? Because your headquarters it's, it's is in It's technically in Oklahoma City. It's right by Tinker, but it's okay. technically in Oklahoma City. And your corporate headquarters is in Moore? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, plans to use the 150,000 square foot manufacturing and warehouse plus a remainder for office and meeting spaces. Yeah, so we're, we're actually quickly filling it up. I, I think there's going to be very little uh, office space by the time we're all said and done. We, we also are doing a bunch of our customization there and quickly finding ways between storing inventory, making new products, customizing products to use all the space. And in fact, one of your goals is to produce a million pieces of drinkware in one year. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's probably closer to, to 2 million at okay. this point. We have the machinery and the equipment to go much bigger than that. Some of it is being realistic about how aggressive should we try to be when we've never done this at this kind of scale before. So I think for us, it's a good stretch goal to say, hey, can we make a million and a half, two million pieces? We sell probably about 12 million pieces a year at this point. So it's a significant part of our production, but also it just shows just how much stuff is being made every day to support the company. In fact, I was talking to our chief manufacturing officer and he said, internationally, we made 385,000 units just in the last seven days. So it's kind of difficult to wrap your mind around, you know, and people ask me like, oh, so you're going to make everything here. And it's like, man, that maybe at some point that'd be great. But it's also like, it's a very daunting idea with the the rate that we're growing it and the amount of stuff we're making. I'm really proud to report that we are learning very quickly and developing the competencies very quickly. In 2015, when you, when the company started, you did $20,000 in sales. Right. And now your projections I've seen on paper 90 million, almost 90 million. I think the conversation we had before we turned the camera on was that you think it could be north of 100 million. Yeah, probably pretty significantly north. So of significant million. success in a very short amount of time. Right. What do you attribute that just rapid success to? I think it's a combination of two things. We we do a, an excellent job of operating the business. I mean, you have to be very competent to grow a company at, at this rate, especially when you're working with the biggest retailers in the world. And so we take a lot of pride in doing things at the absolute highest level that we can. But I think more fundamentally, the reason why we've been successful is because we have a clear vision and mission that drives the company. There's a reason why we exist. I mean, the world has a lot of drinkware companies. Why does the world need another drinkware company? And the the reason that we've come to for this company existing is there's not a lot of companies trying to do what we are trying to do, which Mm -hmm. is build something that is about generosity, that has a large view of the responsibility we have to the, the society that, we, that we're surrounded by, and that's really built on relationships. And interestingly, that's a very cultural idea right now. You know, with COVID, there was this like, hey, everything's going work remote, mm-hmm. you know, in office doesn't matter at all. 
And we really went the other way. We we really believe that having meaningful relationships with the people you work with inside of your company and the people you engage with outside the company is a huge part of success. And it's a huge part of people wanting to stay doing the same thing for an extended period of time. So I, I would attribute most of our success to the fact that we have a clear why. We're very good at the what, but the why we do things and how we do things are different. And as a result, that combined with being really excellent in the execution of the what has really helped the company be successful. A great outward example of your mission-driven ideas are, according to your own website, you support over 1,055 a a organizations. It probably goes up every single day. Yeah. And that you've donated $2 million in cash, a $1 million in products, and 10%, 10% of profits annually. Right. So fortunately, that number's, I think it's going to be at $3.8 million as of tomorrow. Um, it, it keeps going up. And one of the reasons why it's so many organizations is every single year, a portion of our giving budget gets equally allocated to every single employee in the company. Uh, and what that looks like is several thousand dollars worth of giving that every single employee is able to allocate to a nonprofit of their choice, which is certainly one of the, the big perks of working here. Another reason that you're a great place to work certified. Right, right. Yes. And, and you know, but we're constantly asking ourselves, how do we more fully live this out? Uh, what does it really look like to be a generous company. And, you know, I think the challenge is that we're surrounded in culture by a way of doing things that is not necessarily the best way to do things. It's just the way that things have been done in the right. last 100 or 150 years in, in our culture. And so we do ask a lot of why questions like, well, why is it the companies approach things that way? And is there is there a better or a different way to do it? And we're happy to experiment and try new things. And so uh, we do some really atypical things as a result including reshoring or yeah. bringing manufacturing back to the United States. Traditionally, this, this product segment has been heavily manufactured outside the United States. You've invested in manufacturing here in the United States. Talk to us about uh, the philosophy, the idea, the, the things you had to overcome to make that, that from yeah. uh, an idea to reality. Well, I think high level, if COVID taught us anything, it's that having so much right. of our supply chain concentrated and dependent on particular parts of Asia is probably just unwise. It's unwise because of political tensions. It's unwise because of logistical problems. Like if all of your antibiotics come from a certain place in the East and you, for whatever reason, can no longer trade or you can't adequately get things moving from there, like that is, that is a bad situation. So we experienced that, I think, as a culture as a whole. I think more specifically, we looked at it and said, This is an opportunity for us to pass more value to the customer, for us to employ more people, for us to more fully, you know, embody the mission that that we want to be a part of. And so there were a lot of wins. There's a lot of challenges. I mean, I think in general, one of the reasons why people don't do it is it's expensive. It takes long term thought processes. And most companies in this in in our country that are not privately owned, think on a quarterly basis because they've got to please shareholders. Right. Uh, so you have to have enough capital that you're willing to really make an investment and enough vision that you're willing to think in five or 10 year chunks. And it turns out that's actually in fairly short supply. So, uh, but when we looked at it, we just thought this is, this is worth doing and this is a no brainer. And yeah, it's going to be difficult, but you can kind of abstract and just say, how do great companies make money? And they, the way that great companies make money is they make money by doing things that are hard or impossible for other people to do, right? Right. right. Like that's why you get paid by the market because you're doing right. something difficult and something that's not easy. So we looked at it as, hey, this is just another competitive advantage, another way to live out our mission. And oh, by the way, there's a chance that there's a future where like you can't get products from China or you know costs make it prohibitively expensive. So we've been really happy to partner with Walmart and some other organizations that have been very excited about the idea of bringing domestically made Triton plastic products. And we're we're examining, hey, can we even make insulated stainless steel and some of our other products here domestically? In fact, you've spent, you've invested $6 million since the beginning of 2022 on specifically that, on, on manufacturing, not just in the United States, but here in Oklahoma. Yeah, absolutely. So my view of manufacturing, and this is true, not just in America, this is true globally, is automation is here, you know, the artificial intelligence, the automation, the mechanization of things. Uh, There's factories in China that they call lights out factories, dark factories, because they never even turn on the lights because it's all done by machines. 
And this is this is the future of manufacturing. It's going to be this partnership of man and machine. And so when we set out to build this factory, we said, we're going to invest the kind of money where we can create really high quality jobs. I don't want to create jobs where somebody's just moving something right. from one place to another over and over again. I want to create the kind of jobs where people are able to kind of program and control and use automation and robots to work effectively where we're creating, uh, you know, jobs that somebody wants to hold for 10, 20 years. So it's not replacement of jobs. It's just a transition as to what you are doing yeah. within, the, within the process. Yeah, absolutely. And this is always one of the fears of technology and automation is like, oh, it's going to take all of our jobs. And it's like, it does. It does destroy jobs that did exist, but new ones are created, right? right? Replacement. Exactly. And that's where we want to be as an economy. You want to be on the front end of where jobs are being created. Where you don't want to be is being disrupted where all of the jobs that your people have are the types of jobs that are going away. And so this is one of the ways we're having entrepreneurship and innovation in our community is vital for our economic future is that we are at the forefront of that as opposed to kind of holding on with our fingernails to the way that, you know, people made money here 20, 30 years ago. And there's a great amount of logic that if you're going to reshore, bring this manufacturing back to the yep. United States, that Oklahoma is a perfect place to do that. It, it is shockingly, when I talked with uh, the person who owns our primary manufacturer overseas, and we talked about different elements. So we, we, at one point we explored a, a joint venture. They were shocked at land prices. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they were like, surely you couldn't do that. The land must be too expensive. And I'm, I was like, no, not in Oklahoma. It's not, right. you know, some of the things, uh, whether, whether it was labor or land, there were just some assumptions that, that weren't true about what it would take to really stand up an operation here. So I agree. There's a lot of, we've, we've worked with several different groups from the Chamber of Commerce to the Oklahoma Manufacturing Alliance. There are a lot of different organizations, incentives, and structures in place to make it very possible to stand up manufacturing here. And then you have distribution from the center of the country. Yes, absolutely. And that is non-trivial uh, for sure. Like being able to, you know, whether it's working with a company like Walmart that'll come and pick up product from you and they're able to then take it to a distribution center that's in the center of the country and they have less distribution costs getting it to all of their different Walmarts. Or if it comes to shipping out orders from e-commerce, you're really creating an efficiency of not having to, you know, create additional shipping, which is inefficient, inefficiency that ultimately the customer pays for. Now you've often described Simple Modern as a, a company that developed its mission first and then the products secondarily. Yeah, absolutely. I want to read the mission statement because I want to have a discussion about yeah. exactly how you landed on this and why it's so important to, to do all of these things. So Simple Modern's mission statement is we exist to give generously. Notice, was it to make money or to manufacture right. anything, was to give generously. Our core value of generosity is at the heart of everything we do, from how we treat our employees, partners, vendors, and customers, to our affordable prices, warranties, and replacement policies. We also continue to give away at least 10% of profits to various nonprofit organizations through, the process that seek, through a process that seeks input and contribution from every employee. Right. A very big, bold motion statement. Sometimes mission statements are one sentence, but you, yeah. you packed a lot in there. Yeah. And Work that's kind of, process and of that's, that's kind of the extended, you know, sometimes we will just say the mission statements, we exist to give generously. And that's kind of, you, you kind of did the more full version of it, but it is quite simply, what, it, what would it look like if you created a for-profit company? The reason the company existed was to enrich the lives of every single stakeholder that it interacts with, the customer, the employees, the community, the nonprofits, that are that are both locally and and internationally that we work with the shareholders we we live in this very one dimensional world right now uh because of the way that the capital structure of most companies have developed where the shareholder is preeminent and everything else is a very distant right. second third fourth and so we're just asking the question well what if all of those groups were important like we're unapologetic it's capitalism. It's a for-profit company. It matters making a return for the shareholders, but not at the expense of it being fantastic for the employees, not at the expense of the local community, right. not at the expense of the customer having to pay more than they should and not giving the customer amazing value. And we try to live in that place where you're holding in tension all of the different stakeholders and saying, how do we create a company where everyone wins together? And it turns out, not surprisingly, if you do that, that all those stakeholders get really excited about helping right. you win, right? Buying your products mm -hmm. and, and continuing to help you in your mission. 
engaged employees, engaged vendors, sure. relationships, et cetera, all the way up and down the value chain. Yeah. And if it weren't for Simple Modern's success today, there'd be a, a lot of people would tell you that's simply impossible to do. Well, I, I think it's it's difficult to have vision for something that you haven't seen examples for. And one of the things we want to do is be an example that, yes, you can do something different. Uh, I definitely think, you know, we're at a stage in, in our life cycle as a company where most companies, if they become this successful, they just sell. They sell to PE right. and or, you know, they go public or whatever. And a lot of the things that made them special in the first place start to drift away. Mm-hmm. We're excited about going into the next stage of our growth as a company with the same leadership team intact in and with a continued hunger and focus to recognize the mission at a larger level. Sadly, that's missing a lot in our culture, but we view a, a part of our responsibility is there are many people now watching the brand, both in the state and nationally. And we see that to be a stewardship of, hey, we're going to give an example of there's a different way to do things so that People can look at it and say, I want to build something like that. Not exactly that. And I'm, I'm really open about this. I don't think we figured out the best way to do things. I don't even know that there is a best way to do things, but it's worked for us. And to the extent that people can look at our culture and our mission and can take pieces from that as inspiration to build something similar, I'm all for it. And now as we're reshoring or bringing manufacturers back to the United States, back to Oklahoma, there is a cascade effect, a domino effect right. around around manufacturing in Oklahoma because you're here, because people are being employed and, and they're taking their paychecks and, and putting that into the local economy as well. But people to be your vendors, to be your distribution partners, to be involved in the success of the business as it moves forward, simply because of their geographical location right. and the synergy that can be created that way. Well, it takes a real ecosystem to make some of these right. things possible. And this is one of the things about China that they've done an excellent job of developing, and we simply have not, is they've created a really robust ecosystem of people that do all of the different things that you need to manufacture effectively. And from a variety of reasons, we could talk from political to economic reasons why America does not have that same backbone But I think it's pretty clear that we're going to need that kind of a backbone, that just because globalism has helped and and the Internet has helped us to be much more global in our thinking, there are times for for safety reasons or political reasons or just logistical reasons why you need to have capabilities domestically to do certain things. And so we're, we're probably at the front end of that movement. And hopefully what people like us doing this helps to create is more of that kind of ecosystem here where it's that much easier for the next company who right. wants to manufacture here uh, because they've got people like us that they can talk to, but that they also, um, that there's more vendors selling the things that they need and it's just a more robust ecosystem. And more understanding of uh, the, the non-traditional idea of risk and things like that have, have been dispelled. Right. And the opportunity and the advantages are, are what the focus should be moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from the outside, I think our manufacturing venture has seemed much more risky to other people than it seems to us. Now, we're uniquely positioned because we've created a brand and we're not um, a contract manufacturer where we're just manufacturing for somebody else. And I think there there are some situations where it is more risky when you're saying, hey, I, I don't actually own the the kind of demand piece of the equation. I'm, I'm kind of a middleman that's helping to fill orders for somebody. But the way we've done it's been vertical integration. Hey, we've we've found a lot and created a lot of demand. And now as vertically integrating our operation really has just led us to be able to offer more value to customers. As an example, at Walmart, we are going to be offering some items next year that we offered this year. We will offer them at less expensive retails and they will go from being made internationally domestically. We've been able wow. to take it from international domestic and offer it at a better cost to the customer as a result of the investment we've made. Something most experts, I'm doing the air quotes, experts yeah. would tell you you can't do. Right, right. Also, most of those experts, as to continue to do my air quotes, those experts would say manufacturing in the United States is not viable and you can't do that in Oklahoma, right? How many right. times have we heard that in our right. lifetime? So as in Oklahoma and as someone who likes to dispel these myths and specifically is, is invested, and you told me earlier that you intend to, to spend your entire life here in Oklahoma, you are also in the forefront of an example of, of Oklahoma keeping our best and brightest at home. Right. Uh, you're a product of, product of OU, the multitude of OU graduates that are working here as yeah, well. Quite so what, is, what's, what does it do for you as a CEO and how does it make you feel being able to uh, 
uh, make the connection back to the university. And I know you've done some some teaching there and you have yeah. a program there, et cetera. So let's talk about what you're doing at OU and how you're trying to develop the the, the, the future of of business through the University of Oklahoma and what, and what you're doing here with Simply Modern. Sure. So I, I would say, first and foremost, the people in Oklahoma are certainly, uh, I've, I've traveled a lot. Uh, some of the best people I've ever met in my life, have most of the best people I've ever met have been from Oklahoma, the, the character, the work ethic, um, and the intelligence, like Oklahoma can stack up with any place in the world. And we're really moving into a period in human history where geographic location is going to matter less than it ever has mm. before. A great example is just in dating. Dating used to be completely geographic based. And now more and more, it really is becoming a dating app uh, dominated, you know, kind of endeavor. And it's just, it's just an example, like Physical proximity used to be everything, and now it's not everything. And that's especially true with the internet and Shopify and Amazon and just the the nature of the economy that we live in. So you can build something great here. You can build something great in Madagascar. You can build something great anywhere where you have an internet connection. Right. And it really becomes about drive. It becomes about want to and drive and growth mindset and a willingness to work on something long enough to develop the competencies and the skills to do it at an elite and an excellent level. And those people exist all over the world. And I tell this to students all the time. They are coming out of a period in American history where if you were just born in America, you were going to do great compared to somebody who was born in Miramar or, you know, wherever, Bangladesh. That's not going to be as true over the next 40 years right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not going to be that just because you were born in America, you're going to have everything handed to you because uh, companies are getting smart. They're realizing, hey, there are really hungry people all over the world that will do excellent work and they're more than happy to hire people remote. And I think you're going to see much more of a meritocracy in terms of winners. Like it is true that business is still, it's a very relational endeavor where relationships matter and and who you know does matter a lot. But I would say who you know and where you are matters less than it ever has before. You know, even if you sell on Amazon, we sold in the Amazon marketplace for a long time before we initiated a direct relationship. We never talked to anybody. It was all dealing with, you know, computers and algorithms. Right. And so you're going to be, we're, we're entering into a phase where the global economy, it's going to be, it's going to be about merit and it's going to be about drive and I have a lot of confidence that the people of Oklahoma can compete in that kind of a system and can thrive. What I want is to be a source of encouragement and a source of knowledge for people that want to grow. And and that's not just for people in Oklahoma. This is why I started doing social media. You know, I'll have people from Africa or the Middle East or whatever that will follow my content. And I love it. I love when people who are hungry and all they need is somebody to help them understand, hey, what does it take to be successful? But I especially feel a responsibility here. That's why I've taught at the University of Oklahoma. For sure, that was a huge part in in my story. Uh, and I love it when we're able to bring people around the company and show them how we do things, whether it's through internships or, you know, shadowing opportunities and different things. So as you could tell from this conversation, Mike is going to give a very interesting keynote address for the 2023 OVF Awards. Those are on Thursday, May 18th wanted to have this conversation with you today, Mike, because I want as many people to get in the room as possible and to hear this presentation, but also engage in all the things that Oklahoma Venture Forum is doing sure. as well. Some of the awards will be given away that day will be the Economic Impact Award, Venture of the Year, which I hear you guys might be nominated for and it'll be a hard one to beat, but you never know. Uh, most Promising New Venture, that is presented by the Oklahoma Business Incubators Association, the Entrepreneurial Champion Award presented by Oklahoma in Innovation Technology Alliance, and the Incubator Tenant of the Year presented by the Oklahoma Business Incubator Association. A full-packed program, a great keynote speaker, a lot of business expertise, leadership, and innovation in the same mm -hmm. room together, coming together to make each other better, celebrate each other's victories, and continue this process of making Oklahoma a extremely successful and viable business opportunity. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today, Mike, and looking forward to that keynote presentation on Thursday, May 18th. Thursday, not Wednesday, Thursday, May 18th. Thanks, Mike. Looking forward to it. Thank you.